Welcome to the Friday the 13th edition of Forecast Lab. Thank you for choosing this channel and glad to have you here. Let's start out taking a look at the surface analysis. So what we'll do is take a look at the big picture and then after that we're going to go into the regional news and events. Looking at the surface map out east, cold advection, strong northwest winds flowing into the Appalachians, the Midwest, and the East Coast. The frontal system itself is offshore with the heavier convective precip, but cold air funneling back in behind with 41 in Atlanta with northwest winds dropping down to the 30s in Ohio and the 20s in northern New York, and snow bands following the departure of that system, snow coming down in Charleston, West Virginia, as well as Nashville. Out to the west, the air mass is recovering, the ridge located about right there, and we get the return flow in the high plains. Temperatures are rather balmy, 43 up there at Denver, with 42 at Burlington, Colorado, but the cold air remains entrenched in North Dakota and Minnesota with persistent fog and snow out around Fargo and down towards Sioux Falls. Let's head out west, another Pacific system. Heavy rains coming down on the San Joaquin Valley, Sacramento, and the foothills of the Sierra Nevada. In the wake of this system, thermal troughing, indicating the axis of the colder air, but we're already getting warm air advection and pressure falls out to the west, and that'll bring our next system inland for this weekend. Heading up north, unsettled conditions in British Columbia, rather mild in Alaska, kind of a weak northerly flow through that state, but we get into some very cold air in northern Canada. Temperatures down to minus 33 this afternoon at Resolute, the core of the Arctic air located around western Baffin Island, and some strong, bitterly cold cold advection heading into Hudson Bay, reinforcing that last shot of cold air that's up in northern Quebec. Then down to the south, Montreal, Quebec City, and Toronto getting some heavy snow. And that's part of that comet cloud, that cold conveyor belt wrapping around the backside of that New England low pressure system. In the southeastern U.S., this frontal system brought severe weather to this region of the U.S. yesterday. There was an enhanced risk across much of northern Georgia and central Alabama. And with that, 37 tornadoes reported, mostly in Alabama, with a large number of high wind reports throughout the southeast. Those thunderstorms started in East Texas Monday night, moving rapidly to the east by early Tuesday, pretty good MCS there, with some breaks in the line, which helped support a few isolated supercells. And that continued tracking eastward during the day. You can see some bowed segments here and there, which is indicative of strong winds. And that continued moving east. Most of the tornado activity was done by this time, but it was still producing some high winds as it moved through Georgia. Here we see one of the tornadic storms about 8 in the morning yesterday that affected Winston County. That's believed to be EF2. And let's take a closer look at that. That dot is going to be where the significant damage was. There's the supercell off to the west-southwest. And as that approaches, you can see the concavity right there, indicating the stronger inflow into the storm. And this is also hinting at some rotation, kind of like that. The storm relative velocity does show a couplet, somewhat range folded, but we're looking at uh, the Birmingham radar to the southeast. And we've got about 43 in, about 40 out. So that is certainly some significant rotation, especially at that range. This is up at about 7,500 feet or so. Is pretty high to be sampling these things, but that's about the closest radar site we have. And there you can see the couplet approaching. Looks like they changed the VCP to pick that up better. Got about 69 in and 34 out. And then you can see it move on off towards the east. So 
at about the uh, peak strength right there. I'll put a dot right there. You can compare that to the reflectivity. And we can see that that is an embedded vortex. So very hazardous, rain-wrapped, and you would not really get much lead time on that if you were not monitoring the official warnings. Later in the day, we were dealing with a hazardous storm out ahead of the line that was close to Montgomery. You can see that moving across Autauga County, EF3 damage associated with that one. So we'll get rid of the tornado warning box and take a closer look at that cell. Again, that's out ahead of the line. You can see it's got unrestricted access to this inflow. And as it moves to the northeast towards this dot where the significant damage was, you can definitely see some supercellular structure to that. The curl towards the inflow region and also this little donut shape probably corresponding to the TVS. It's hard to tell if that's an artifact, but yeah, that certainly looks like a vortex. So we can take a look at the velocity on that storm starting out about 1230, the area of damage located right there. And we've got kind of a broad circulation starting out. And as it approaches our damage location, the circulation tightens. Right there, we've got, uh, it says 35 out, that could be aliased. Around that, we've got 45, 49, so that could be aliased data. And then we've got 96 inbound, so that's going to be well over 100 knots of gate-to-gate -gate shear right there. So that's certainly capable of producing a tornado. So that tracks on off to the east, and it maintains those strong gate-to-gate -gate shears and probably maintains that long enough to where there could be some potential of a long-track tornado. Don't know that for sure, but that's kind of what we see during those types of events. This afternoon, a mixture of lake effect snows and cold air advection showers. Those are focused on the Great Lakes as well into the Appalachians. We can see some clearing starting to work into some parts of Lake Huron and Lake Superior. And at Sault Ste. Marie and the Mackinac Straits located right there, clear skies, which they have not really seen in quite a while. With this outgoing system on the East Coast, there's been rain across much of Massachusetts and New York. Rain totals up to about one inch on Long Island and wind damage reported in southeastern Massachusetts. And this photo looks like Alaska, doesn't it? That was Caribou, Maine this morning. The observer getting ready to launch the radio sonde, and they recorded 12 inches of new snow, bringing the total up to 17 inches. Wow, that's a beautiful photo right there. That's the weather service in Bismarck, North Dakota showing light pillars. And they've had quite a bit of fog problems. This has been their second foggiest winter on record in the past 17 years. Shifting over to California, and they've had a lot of weather going on there. One of the first rain bands from this weekend system moving across the San Joaquin and Sacramento Valleys, heading right for the Sierra Nevadas, and that's gonna dump a lot of new snow in the higher elevations. And we take a look at the high resolution rapid refresh, run that forward into the nighttime hours. And you can see it's not quite over. More showers developing out around the Bay Area right around midnight. And that rain will continue falling throughout the evening. So where's that rain coming from? Well, looking at California, we see a segment of the polar front jet right there, the tighter height contours indicating a jet max and also upper level lift in this area right here we've got the higher positive vorticity kind of a little bit disorganized but picking out a few lobes right there and we're going to find a lot of vertical motion upward lift out ahead of that so we're looking at midday and then by this evening that spreads into the sierras and into nevada and then we get kind of a very short respite but you can see more energy coming in from the west, affecting mostly the northern California coast. And it eventually spreads down into Los Angeles. You can see the tighter 
packing right there. There's the height gradient and upper level lift in Southern California for tomorrow night. So the midday surface chart looks like this. Not very much showing it at the surface. This is going to be the surface pressure and the 1,000 through 500 millibar thickness. And this just shows some troughing at the surface. We can pick out the forecast precip right there. The next system offshore right there, there's the fronts and the occlusion extending up to the north. And that heads into Northern California overnight. The precip picks up. And there's that front, well, I'm going to call that an occlusion, bearing down on North California, the main cold front down to the south, the main warm front like that. And that heads inland tomorrow morning. And 981 millibar low off of Oregon. And the whole thing spreads inland into Nevada. They're expecting 8 to 16 inches on Mount Charleston above 6,000 feet and 1 to 3 feet of snow along the eastern Sierras. And in California itself, when everything's said and done, about an inch in the San Joaquin Valley and about one to two feet of snow in the mountains. And as you can see, yet another system coming in from the west. This is going to be around the Monday, Sunday night to Monday time frame. This is a little bit more south. And that heads inland. And we look out to the west again. Well, we've got a different system heading into Washington for Wednesday. But things are looking a little bit better. I'm seeing a little bit more high pressure out there across California. So maybe a very slow tapering of the storm activity. So we go back to the very beginning and look at the rest of the country. There's our cold air advection. The red lines showing the thickness, which is kind of like the average isotherm in the bottom half of the troposphere. So lots of cold air coming down into the Midwest and into Tennessee and Kentucky. No wonder they've got snow there in Nashville. The old rule of thumb says you use the 540 decameter line as the rain-snow transition. That's just kind of a rule of thumb. And they're well back behind that 540 line. So going forward into the weekend, that's going to correspond to an upper level low. So the precip doesn't completely shut down until Sunday. But we start getting warming out there in Texas as that ridge heads on off to the east. So southerly flow developing in the plains, and that tends to be warm. And then we get some pressure falls in Colorado as these series of Pacific systems approaches from the west. And you can see that by Sunday, Snow's picking up in the Rockies, Colorado, New Mexico, and this next low picking up and heading into the Midwest. Then we look out west once again. Here comes another shot of energy. This is more into the panhandles. And we start getting an area of precip. This is probably going to be convection, maybe an MCS for Tuesday night into Wednesday. So I'm going to put the fronts maybe like that. That's just kind of ballparking based on my own experience. This is going to be a warm advection regime right there, maybe some isentropic lift over that. And in the wake of that, cold air advection. And that moves into the southeastern U.S. for midweek. Maybe some storms in that area. And some clearing, very much like what we have right now. Less cold air advection in the wake for a week from now. And it just kind of looks like a mild pattern across the country. The flow is offshore in the Gulf region, so not much warm air coming north at this point. And things look pretty stormy for the 23rd. This is getting to the very end of this particular chart sequence, but that does look pretty interesting. Powerful low in the southern Rockies, and where did that come from? doesn't look like very much impact in California, and that's probably because of a strong northwesterly flow. And if that happens, yeah, that'll shut down the storm track in California. Every day, the Weather Prediction Center keeps track of the warmest and coldest location in the country. And these are the totals for all of 2022. This graphic just came out. Obviously, Death Valley picking up a lot of those records. And on the cold side, Peter Sinks, Utah, 
picking up a lot of the records as well. It's interesting not seeing Alamosa on this map very much. Back in the old days, Alamosa always had the coldest temperature in the summertime. But due to all the changes in the observing network, that has obviously changed a little bit. Here's the exact values, the highest anywhere in the country in the lower 48, 125 at Death Valley. That was July 16th and September 6th, and the coldest was minus 50, just a few days before Christmas, at Elk Park, Montana, and north of White Sulphur Springs. And just checking in on Siberia this morning, still picking up minus 71. That's the same station that recorded minus 80 earlier in the week. That was the coldest temperature ever observed in Russia since 2002. Some stations also well down to minus 50, minus 60. And if you want to know which ones are which, there's the overlay of station names. So, Jalinda, that's it right there. A little bit of a buzz on social media about that record. And minus 74, I guess that's going to be the coldest one we observed this morning. And the biggest city in this region, that's going to be Yakutsk which is right in this area right there. It looks like minus 50 this morning. And the next biggest city is probably going to be Irkutsk, which is down here near Lake Baikal, only minus 15. And some extreme cold down in the stands. Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, all that. Turkmenabat, located right here, down to minus 13 this morning. Their previous record was minus 11. That was set about 120 years ago. And there's a more conventional look at that data. This is done with digital atmosphere and some imported GFS data. You can already see 1052, 56 millibar high. So yeah, that's gonna be a cold polar high covering the area and Turkmen about located right there. And for those who want the station names, there you go. Enjoy. Closer to home with that strong Pacific influence, not going to see any records. Pretty much empty of those for Saturday. For Sunday, not really any records. It is showing 34 at Hibbing, Minnesota, but they've seen it as high as 51 in January. So that may be an artifact of not enough climatology data. For Monday, starting to see some 80s working into South Texas. For Tuesday, that heat spreads northward. Austin, Houston, and uh, what is TVR? I'm not sure what that is. Anyway, they are showing records being broken for the date. Nothing showing on the map for Wednesday. And Thursday, no records. So that will do it for this edition of Forecast Lab. Hope you have a great weekend. Take care, and we'll see you back here in a few days. Bye-bye.